St. Peter's Wellsbourne's reflective service for Good Friday. We will work our way through uh, Mark's record of what happened on the first Good Friday uh, with six readings and short reflections and uh, windows for you to reflect and pray. My prayer is that this would be a really meaningful time and that you would know God better um, at the end of it. Let's pray. Father, on the day when you showed your love as Jesus died and gave himself for us, as you opened your heart of love for us, may you open our hearts and may we meet you today. Amen. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they accuse you of. But Jesus still made no reply and Pilate was amazed. Now it was custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Brabus was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. No, it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to get Pilate to release Brabus instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Very early in the morning, the people who determined to get rid of Jesus made their plans. They thought it out. They needed the Roman governor to pass sentence on Jesus so he could be executed properly, which they weren't allowed to do. Pilate was told, we've got a troublemaker here, calls himself Messiah. You'd better deal with him. Pilate, plain speaking soldier, says, King of the Jews, are you? And is staggered when Jesus doesn't answer, not to any of it. Pilate quickly sees this is no revolutionary, no Lenin, no Che Guevara. Find a way to release him. Put the chief priest's noses out of joint. But they outsmart him by stirring up the mob. What's going on here? The chief priests have made their plans and the plans seem to be working. Pilate is being manipulated. But you can't manipulate God. What's the old joke? How do you make God laugh? You tell him your plans for the future. Something much greater much more mysterious is happening than simply another innocent man falling foul of powerful people. This incident in an occupied province is going to reverberate around the world for centuries. When we make our own plans, when we dream our own dreams, does God come into them?
Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with the staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him, and when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. How quickly the people's mood has changed. The adulation, the adoration and the loud hosannas of Sunday, gone. The mood has changed. Now jeers and sneers, insults, mockery and anger. And the humiliation of a purple robe and a crown of thorns. The verbal abuse, the hostility of the soldiers, the cowardice of Caesar, the one man who could have saved him. Yes, saved him. The one man. But no, he was a people pleaser who simply washed his hands. Am I a people pleaser? Are you? Where am I in that courtyard? Who am I? Where are you in that courtyard? Who are you? And the loneliness and the darkness of mockery and rejection the betrayal of those once so close, followers, loved ones, friends. How hard, how hurtful, and yet silently he endured it for you and for me, for us. The very worst that humanity has ever brought to God, yet the very best that God brings to humanity. I fear I am there, and I fear that you are there. Yes, I know we're there. We're there readily and willingly leading him out to Calvary. Father, forgive us. Amen.
A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in the, in, from the country. They forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of charge against him read, The King of the Jews. Friends, our world has changed very much these last few weeks. We may not be living in a police state, but due to this horrible virus, we're having to do what we're told, and that's new to many of us. But at the time of Jesus, people were expected to obey orders, and so Simon of Cyrene got dragged into something that had nothing to do with him. A man was being taken to his place of execution. He was going to be crucified. He'd been severely beaten and was too weak to carry his own cross. And so they picked on Simon and they ordered him to carry the cross. I wonder what he thought as he carried that cross. This thing is heavy, really heavy. Just how far have I got to go with it? Why did I get landed with this job? You know, I had my own plans for today. Oh, this thing's heavy. It's so unfair. People will think I'm the one who's about to be crucified, not him. But I can't refuse. I can't put it down and run. I'm just a nobody. I am powerless. Are we nearly there yet? This thing, oh, it's heavy. This horrible virus which has been inflicted upon all of us. We didn't cause it and yet our friends are dying from it. And that doesn't feel fair especially when we see the impact it's having, the deaths and the isolation. None of this has been our choice, and that doesn't feel fair. But I wonder, I wonder if just maybe in our Bible passage, Simon begins to think about the man for whom he's carrying that cross. Perhaps he glances over at him and walks beside him. Who is he? What dreadful things has he done to deserve death by crucifixion? And maybe, maybe when they get to Golgotha, he hangs around and watches as the story unfolds before him. Friends, I don't really know what Simon thought, but what I do find interesting is that Mark specifically tells us that Simon was father to Alexander and Rufus. And Mark wouldn't have mentioned their names if they were not known to the early church. So maybe, just maybe, Simon did become a believer. Maybe he came to realise that Jesus, forsaken by everyone, was indeed the promised Messiah. Maybe he came to realise that Jesus chose not to save himself, but rather to go through with the cross in order to save us. And as we read these verses, we step back into the injustices of our present situation. Like me, you may be feeling that our burden is heavy too. Simon of Cyrene is forced to carry the burden for Jesus. But Jesus is the one who chooses to take unto himself the burden of all burdens. He was falsely accused. Jesus was spat upon, mocked, beaten, and then crucified. He was, as we'll see in a few minutes, cut off from God. And yet he didn't do it out of necessity or for himself. He did it in love for us. And so as we travel together at this most burdensome time, we know that there is one walking beside us too, who chooses to carry the greatest of burdens with us. As we carry our burden, we discover that he's the one who carries it with us too.
They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. The soldiers have mocked Jesus. Passers-by have jeered at him. The religious leaders laugh at him behind his back. And those crucified beside him hurl insults at him. Is he who he claims to be? This has already happened to Jesus at the start of his ministry. In the wilderness, Satan tempts him to prove who he says he is by using power to his own ends. If you are the son of God, turn stones into bread, amaze people with a superman stunt. And here comes the temptation again. Show who you are and convince us by a fantastic feat. Come down now from your cross and save yourself. But Jesus has come to save us. And the test is how to do it, not by a one-off stunt, but by allowing evil to do its worst once and for all, not to us, but to him. In the desert, Jesus used the word of God for his defense. Now, he allows his silence to speak for him. This is a testing time for us all. How are we being tested? Are we who we claim to be as his followers? What is a real test for you?
At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come to take him down. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and of Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. I tend to think that it's the things that we do, the choices we make, that uh, show who we really are. But sometimes it's the things that we let happen to us that God can really use. And here is Jesus, alone, inactive, abandoned by friends and abandoned by God. And yet at its very moment of death, John records that the curtain that was the wall between the holiest of holies, God's presence in the temple, and the rest of the world, that wall, that curtain was ripped apart, broken down. God revealed to the world. Maybe that's why it suddenly seems so different to one of the executioners. Surely this man, a son of God.
It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So, as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. Thank mm -hmm. you.